get into God's presence. Amen. How many have been how many been anticipating for God to continue to move? Amen. 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 We want to welcome you to another night of glory to our chosen generation conference. TLH welcomes you. The pastors of the house welcome you. We are happy to have you. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get into his glory. Let's praise him. Let's lift him up. Let's honor him. Lord, we put another night of glory in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you know in the house that the joy of the Lord is our strength? I'm going to say that again. How many know that the joy of the Lord is our strength? All right. So this is a song that's super special to us. Um, it's called Ha Ha Hallelujah. Lyrics are super simple, okay? This is literally the verse. I'm going to sing it just so you can get used to it, okay? Joy of the Lord is my strength. He is my anchor in the midst of the waves. All right, we're going to sing it one more time. Super simple, all right? Like this. So, huh?
of the Spirit is joy. It's your portion. Fruits of the Spirit is joy. It's my strength. It's my strength. You make me strong. You make me strong.
that set us free, the cross that saved us, the cross that redeemed us, the cross that paid our debt once and for all. Lord, we know we live with you in the power of your resurrection, but Lord, help us not to forget the cross.
here today in this space? i 
Oh, we lift up praises to you, Lord. We thank you and we give you all the honor and all the glory. Oh, with, with that same presence, let's go ahead and shift to the word of God tonight. How many are ready to hear from the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. I want to go ahead and invite Pastor Aaron Smith from Upper Room. Let's, God, let's give God glory for what he's doing, what he's doing in this place, what he's doing for the people of God. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Can we give it up for the worship team? Hey, this is a bit of a unique room, so I want to invite you, if you want to, no pressure, but if you want to, especially some of you young ones, if y'all want to come sit up here, you can. It'll help me preach better, I'm sure. It'll help feel, make the room feel a little more, but there's no pressure. If not, I'll jump down there and come sit by you. Um, if you have your Bibles, get, uh, get them out. Do you love the Word of God? Oh, come on. Do you love the Word of God? If you don't love the Word of God, then I'm praying that by the end of the night you do. Open up to Matthew 17. Matthew 17. I caught a flight today to be with you. I came all the way from Dallas, Texas. Anybody from DFW? Any, any Cowboy fans? Woo! Come on, America's team. Amen. Lord, send revival to Dak Prescott. Um, I have a, a two-and-a-half-year-old. Her name is Rosie. I have a nine-month-old son. His name is Shepherd King. And they were really sad this morning when Daddy said he wasn't coming home because he was going out of town. And then my uh, daughter found out that she was going to have a friend come over and they were going to have ice cream. And then she didn't care anymore. She was like, bye, Daddy. I get ice cream. Um, all right, open your Bibles up to Matthew 17, verse 1. And let's read it. Let's read the Word of God. I want to honor your pastors, Pastor Josh and Brenda. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be in the house with you. Not sure where you're at, but thank you for having me. Um, yes, honor your pastors. Come on. Um, all right, Matthew 17, verse 1. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and he led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they had lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. I don't know about you, but that's a, that's a good thing when you only see Jesus. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. Lord, I thank you that your word cuts through opinion. Lord, your, your word cuts through uh, political agendas. Lord, your word is truth, and it's truth established forever. And I pray tonight, Lord, that your truth would pierce hearts. Pray tonight, Lord, that your truth would, would touch minds. I pray that tonight, Lord, we would encounter you. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would reveal to us the man that is behind the pages who is Jesus, our King, our Lord. Lord, that we would encounter him. Lord, let tonight not be a night of hype. Let tonight not be a night where we leave the same way we came. But Lord, let us encounter your presence. Let us encounter your glory and let us be transformed. And so, Lord, we honor you tonight. I pray that you would help me preach this word as well as you preached it to me, Lord. I was so encouraged when you began speaking to me out of Matthew 7. 
17. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help me to speak to hearts in the room the same way you spoke to mine. In Jesus' name I pray. And before you say amen, everyone put your hand on your heart and say, Jesus, my heart is a target for you. Touch it tonight. Amen. Oh, you just set yourself up. It's a dangerous prayer. All right, let me paraphrase this uh, text that I just read for you. So Jesus tells three of his disciples, he says, come up here with me. We're going to go on top of this mountain. And so Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and he goes on top of the mountain. And when he goes on top of the mountain, the Bible says he's transfigured. Anyone seen Twilight? Come on, raise your hand if you've seen Twilight. Robert Pattinson, come on, he's pale as the night. He needs some suntan on him. But when he goes out and he stands in the sun, all of a sudden his skin looks like diamonds. And you know he is not a human. He's a vampire. Well, Jesus was transfigured in the flesh. His skin began to shine. And the disciples saw him, his glory arrayed around him, his power illuminating from him. All of a sudden, the sky splits open, and it becomes a thriller video where Moses and Elijah come back to life. They start speaking to Jesus right in front of Peter, James, and John. And the Bible says that Peter doesn't know what to do, so he just starts talking. Jesus, should we build a temple? We could build three of them, God, right here, right now. We could build you a temple. We could build Moses a temple. We could build Elijah a temple right here, right now. We could start building. We got our hammers. We got our nails. We got it. And all of a sudden, pow, pow, out of the sky, it says a loud noise. And the voice of God says, behold, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. A voice begins to illuminate Jesus even more. All of a sudden, there's silence. It says, Peter, James, and John fall down on their face. Jesus walks over to them, and he touches them. They get up, and all that they see is Jesus. A moment before, they were caught up in the swirl of Moses is here. Elijah's here. Lord, you're shining. But now Jesus touches them, and all they can see, their focus is on the man. Their focus is on Jesus. The Bible says all they saw was Jesus. And then Jesus said, tell no one what has happened. Until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. This is a powerful text. I thought about titling this message Trans Theology, but I thought that's a little too risky and uh, political and controversial. So for the sake of not stepping on anyone's toes, uh, I decided to call this message Being a Friend of God. Being a Friend of God. How many of you want to be a friend of God? Come on, I want to be a friend of God. At the end of every year, I always get my journal out and I ask the Lord, Lord, would you give me vision for the next year? And in 2018, I was sitting with the Lord and I was asking the Lord, Lord, will you give me vision for next year? And I had my journal out and I was ready, waiting to hear what the Lord would say to me. And I heard the Lord say this. He said, Aaron, in this next year, I'm going to teach you to be a friend of God. I'm going to teach you to be my friend. So I wrote that down in my journal, and I said, 2019 is going to be a year that I become friends with God. And I started thinking, woo, I'm going to be friends with God. I'm going to get more speaking opportunities. My name's going to be known. I'm going to make more money than I've ever seen. I'm going to be a friend of God up in here. I had a very limited perspective of what being a friend of God was. But I wrote it down in my journal, and I left that meeting with God excited for all that was to come. Now, it was playoff season for in the NFL, and the Dallas Cowboys were getting ready to host the Seattle Seahawks. Now, I live in Dallas, but I actually live in Arlington. I live about two blocks from uh, AT&T Stadium, which is where the Cowboys play. And I had a yeah, – that's right, come on, heaven on earth. And uh, I had a, a friend who attended the upper room, and he worked for the Cowboys staff. And he said, Aaron, I can get you tickets to any game if you ever let me know. Well, the Dallas Cowboys are finna host Seattle Seahawks for the playoffs. So I text my man, hey, can you get me into the game? He says, yes, I can get you into the game. He gets me on to the, literally right behind the players, what's called uh, uh, the Miller Light Club. And it's basically a section that's you're pretty much on the field standing behind the players. You watch the players run in and out of this club to get onto the field and get to the locker room. You're almost in touching distance from the players. 
Now, it is a playoff game, fourth quarter. Dallas is down just a few points. They're driving down the field. All of a sudden, Dak Prescott throws a beautiful pass. The Cowboys score. They win the game. The stadium is erupting. Beers flying everywhere. It's the craziest. People are ripping their shirt off. The Dallas Cowboys have just won a playoff game. But why do I tell you that story? Because I was sitting there, standing actually, watching this unfold, and I could not engage the football game because my heart was so burdened with a stadium full of people who were cheering for a man's football team, but they did not know God. And my heart was burdened. And it was one of the most beautiful moments for Dallas Cowboy fans. Yet for me, I was so disengaged from the game and I felt a burden of intercession for the lost. That night I went home and my wife said, how was the game? And I said, it was, it was okay, but man, my, my heart is just so burdened for the lost. That night I laid my head down and because we live so close to the stadium, until late in the night you could hear people out in the streets partying. And I woke up, and it was about 2.30 in the morning, and I wanted to weep because I was thinking of all of the lost. God, there's so many broken, lost people. And I sat up in my bed, and I said, God, what is this? What is this feeling that I'm feeling? I can't even enjoy my favorite sports team winning a massive win because I'm so burdened for the lost. What is this? And I'll never forget, at 2.30 in the morning, the Lord said this to me. He said, Aaron, welcome to being a friend of God. He said, friends share burdens with friends. And I realized in that moment that the mark of friendship wasn't favor. It wasn't being in the spotlight. It wasn't, it wasn't your name being known. It was actually caring about what God cares about. See, when you're a friend of God, God begins to share his burdens with you. When you're a friend of God, he begins to share things with you that he doesn't share with other people. When you're a friend with God, you begin to see the intricate details of the things that make God's heart beat that normal people don't get to experience. Why? Because you're growing in friendship with him. See, that's what's happening right here in Matthew 17. Jesus is inviting Peter, James, and John into deeper friendship. He's saying, hey, I want to be deeper friends with you. Hey, I want you to know me a little better than you already do. Come up the mountain with me, and I'm going to show you something that the rest of the disciples aren't going to see. I'm going to show you something that the rest of Israel is not going to see. I'm going to show you something that the majority of men on the earth is not going to see. I'm going to show you my glory. That's what's happening in Matthew 17. Jesus is inviting his friends into deeper friendship. See, this is a good point to, to uh, just linger for a moment that Jesus says many are called, but few are chosen. Because what I've actually found is very few say yes to this level of friendship with Jesus. See, many are okay with being surface level with Jesus and having influence for him, but not having intimacy with him. But to the one who say yes, oh, many are called, but few are chosen. And I want to tell you, there's an invitation tonight for you, for you, each and every one of you to go deeper in friendship with Jesus. And you see, I've heard a lot of talk about glory. See, Jesus is transfigured before them. His glory is being expressed before the disciples. And I hear a lot of talk in this day and age about glory. God, we want the glory. God, we want your glory. God, let your glory come. You know what I have found? His glory, uh, uh, the simplest I could put his glory at its absolute core. If you want to see God's glory, you need to learn to be friends with him. See, friendship with God is marked with his glory. Intimacy with God is marked with his glory. See, friendship with God is about going a little deeper with him. Friendship with God is about knowing him just a little bit more. Friendship with God is about building a history with him. Friendship with God is about walking with him day in, day out. See, heaven is not impressed when you come into a meeting like this and you jump around and you wave your flags. That's awesome. Heaven is impressed when you walk out those doors and your life looks the same out there. Heaven is impressed when you live a lifestyle of worship Monday through Monday. Every day. See, you can come in here and you can dance and you can shout and you can lift your hands and then you can go right out that door and get drunk. You can go right out that door and you can party. You can go right out that door 
and look no different than the world. But see, friendship with God means when you leave this place, he goes with you. Yes, thank you, Jesus, for your friendship. Now, before I get to uh, really dissecting this text with you, just a couple of foundational things I want to talk to you about being a friend, a friend of God. See, uh, being a friend of God is not being God's homeboy. See, when I was a teenager, there was a, there was a big trend that was going around where you could go buy T-shirts that says, Jesus is my homeboy. You ever see one of those shirts? Yeah, only the old people in the room are like, yeah, I've seen one. All the young people are like, no. Uh, but there was a T-shirt. It used to go around, Jesus is my homeboy. And there was a trend that's like, yeah, I'm homies with Jesus. Yeah, I'm homies with Jesus. But did you know before you can be a friend of God, he has to be Lord? Did you know there's certain things that come uh, in relationship, there's almost steps, if you would, in relationship. There's almost levels, if you would, in relationship. For, for ex uh, example, before my wife could become my wife, she had to be my fiance. Before she could be my fiance, she had to be my girlfriend. Before she could be my girlfriend, she had to be a friend. Before she could be a friend, she had to be a little mama I saw across the room going, ooh, you cute girl, I need to ask you out. Are you f there's levels of relationship. And before you can be friends with Jesus, you have to first learn that he is Lord of your life. Let me give you scripture to back it up. This is what is happening in John 15, 15, where Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants, but I now call you what? Friends. See, we like to roll past that first part and go, "Ooh, I'm a friend of God. That's so beautiful. But Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants? That means before he called them friend, he called them servant. So before he could call them a friend, they had to learn, Jesus, you're the master. Jesus, you're the savior. Jesus, you're the Lord. See, many of you, you hear me talking about being a friend of God. But first step is you have to give your life to Jesus. You have to say, Jesus, here's my life. Jesus, be Lord. Don't come be my homeboy. Come be my Lord. Come be my Savior. Come be the one who leads me through life. Lord, I need your leadership expressed in my life. And as you begin to walk that journey, as you begin to submit your life under the leadership of Jesus, all of a sudden you begin to grow in relationship with him. And all of a sudden this day comes and you go, I'm a friend of God. I have history with him. I have relationship with him. It shows up in the way you pray. It shows up in the way you sing. It shows up in the way you evangelize. It all happens from a different place. All of a sudden, you're not striving to get into his presence. You know because of history, I'm a friend of God. You see, it's the same thing with parents. See, I'm in a season now in my life where my parents look more like friends to me than parents. Why? Because there was many years, my, my, my young childhood years, my adolescent years, my teenage years, my young 20s, I viewed my parents one way. But now that I'm entering into my 30s, my parents are starting to take a different relationship with me. They look more like friends than they do as parents when I was a teenager. Are you following me? It's the same thing with a pastor. Oftentimes, you don't start becoming friends with your pastor until you've learned to submit your life to your pastor because there is levels of intimacy in relationship. And the same with Jesus. He must first be Lord and Savior before you grow as friends. That means you're a servant first. But the rest, the second part of John 15, 15, it says, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends for servants do not know about the master's business. See, in John 17, what he's doing is he's inviting Peter, James, and John to come and see his business. He's inviting Peter, James, and John to come and see his relationship with the Father. He's inviting Peter, James, and John to come and see Jesus in a way the rest of mankind doesn't. And I want to pull three things out of this text that are so simple things, but they're they're foundational. And if you'll lay hold of these things and begin to implement them in your life, watch how all of a sudden it tethers you to the storyline of growing and maturing in the gospel. And living in his glory. Did you know taking a Christian out of the glory is like taking a goldfish out of water? Do you know Christians aren't meant to be out of the glory? 
We're meant to live in the glory of God. You would never take a goldfish out of the, out of the water. Why? Because they, couldn't, they can't live. They have to live in that substance. They have to live in the substance of water. And did you know that the church is meant to live in the glory of God? Yet so in this hour, there are so many believers that are unfamiliar with God's glory. When God's presence shows up in the room, you have a worship team that's leading you right to his throne. The presence of God comes in. You can look around the room and you can see many people who are unfamiliar with the presence. They don't know how to respond. They don't know how to get on their knees. They don't know how to lift their hands. But let me tell you, you were made for God's glory. You were made for God's glory. And so a couple things I see in the story that God was really speaking to me. It says this in verse 4. Let's just jump back to verse 3. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. So Moses and Elijah show up on the scene, and the Bible says they start talking to Jesus. They're not talking to Peter. They're not talking to James. They're not talking to John. Jesus starts engaging in conversation with Moses and with Elijah. So have you ever been that friend that you're with someone and they see someone that they know and they start saying what's up to their friend, but you're kind of standing on the side like, what's up guys, like I'm here too. You ever been that friend? That's what's happening right now for Peter, James, and John. They're seeing Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. I don't know what in the world they're talking about. And Peter, James, and John are standing to the side, and they're watching this engage, and they start getting nervous energy. You ever had nervous energy where you just start talking? You just start saying things. You don't even know what you're talking about, but because you feel a little awkward, and you feel a little weird, you don't know what to do, you just start talking. That's what happens to Peter, James, and John. And they go, Jesus, we can, we can build you guys a temple. Jesus, we can build you an altar up here on the mountain. Jesus, we can, we can start doing all these things. And the voice comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved son, hear him. In other words, here's point number one, and hopefully you're taking notes tonight. But when you get into the presence of Jesus, here's point number one, are you ready? So profound. Be still. Be still. I know, it's anticlimactic. But we don't know how to be still in 2023. Try turning your phone off for one hour. One hour. I bet you can't do it, especially you teenagers. I'll, 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 if you, tomorrow, I'll tell you what, the first teenager that comes up to me, if you can turn your phone off right now, tomorrow at 7 p.m., by the time service starts, if you can say and you have accountability, you've said, I have had my phone turned off for 24 hours, I'll cash up you 10 bucks. Because we don't know how to be still. We don't know how to just rest. You know, there's a reason the Bible says, be slow to speak and quick to listen. Be slow to speak, but be quick to listen. See, a lot of you get yourselves in trouble because you talk too much. A lot of you don't hear what heaven is saying over your life because you haven't stopped talking. My wife and I, we do marriage counseling, and don't worry. <laughs> we did premarital counseling, and when we got married, we said, we're going to keep doing counseling. It's so good for us. And we've been married for almost six years, and about a year into our marriage, we were sitting with our marriage counselor, and we were talking about some of the dynamics in our home, and we were just, we were talking back and forth, talking back and forth. We were talking about an issue that we were facing together, and all of a sudden, about 30 minutes in, our marriage counselor goes, would you guys stop talking? And we just are like looking at her and our eyes got big. And she goes, I can tell you what the problem is. Neither of you are hearing the other one. You both won't stop talking. Can I tell you, a lot of Christians' lives look the same way with God. Did you know that God is eager to speak to you? Did you know that God is eager to lead you. God is eager to open up his mouth and begin to speak to you. And the reason some of you feel like you can't hear God is because you can't stop talking. And maybe you're not talking out loud, but, but the voice in your heart, the voice in your mind, the voice on the inside doesn't ever stop. But if you can learn to be still in the presence, if you can learn to rest at the feet of Jesus, if you can learn that you don't have to strive yourself into his presence, you just get to rest in the finished work of the gospel and the finished work of the cross, I promise you, God will be quick to speak to you. Get in the presence and be still. Psalm 46.10, it says this. 
It says, be still and know that I am God. God is speaking to David because David is writing about the chaos that is surrounding him. He's writing about a circumstance he's walking through, and life feels crazy. Yet in verse 10 of Psalm 46, the Lord responds to David, and he says, David, here's the antidote for you. Be still and know that I am God. Did you know you're not God? Did you know that you're not Lord of your own life? Come on, to some of you husbands and fathers in the room, did you know you're not the provider of your own family? He is. But if we would be still and rest in the reality that he is God, maybe that's all you need for the breakthrough in your life you're looking for. But like I said, in our day and age, we don't know how to be still. We don't know how to turn off our phones. We don't know how to shut off the music. We don't know how to turn off the TV. Life is so loud and it stills connection. You know, loud, a loud life will steal your connection from, from, from hearing the voice of God, from living in his glory, from living at his feet, at his presence. You can't be busy and live at the feet of Jesus. You have to slow down. You have to be still. We, uh, we're trying to teach our two-and-a-half-year-old this. She loves Coco Melon. She loves Frozen. She loves TV. She loves music. And there was a day where my wife and I were scratching our heads and we were going, what do we do? Every time we try to sit down as a family and have dinner, she just wants a show. She just wants music. She just wants, she, she, she's, she's distracted already at two and a half by the things of this world. And I said, I have an idea. Let's order a dinner bell. My wife goes, a dinner bell? Yeah, let's order a dinner bell. And let's screw it onto the wall. And when dinner's ready, here's what we'll do. We'll walk over to the bell. We'll grab the bell. We'll ring it. Ding, 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 ding. Everyone in the house will hear it. And we'll write a song. And my wife goes, we'll write a song? Yeah, we'll write a song about turning off phones. And my wife is like, okay. My wife's a worship leader, so I'm like, okay, now you write the song. And she's like, what? How are you tricking me into this? But we came up with a song, and the song goes like this. It goes, phones away, screens turned off, family time, family time, family time. Phones away, screens turned off. Family time, family time, family time. Phones away, screens turned off. Family time, family time, family time. Thank you for backing me up for those of you who backed me up. Woo -woo. Why am I telling you this story? Because that was about a month and a half ago. And this morning, this is what's happened in a month and a half since we've done that. This morning, we got up. I was getting ready for work. My wife was making breakfast, and my daughter had pushed her little chair all the way to the wall where the bell is. And we're getting ready, and we hear the bell being rung. And it's my daughter ringing the bell. And we walk into the room, and she by herself is singing the song, phones away, screens turned off, family time, family time, family time. Now she's two and a half. And I walk out, and I'm like, is it family time? And she's saying, yes, it's time for breakfast. Come to the table. So we sit down at the table. My phone rings. I pick my phone up, and she looks at me, and she goes, Daddy, phone's away. <laughs> now, she's two and a half. Why am I telling you this story? Because what we have established in our home in the last month and a half from, with being intentional to be still is we are setting a new normal in our family where we're connecting we're actually sitting around the table together and we're connecting. We're actually getting able to have conversations. Come on, if a two and a half year old can do this, you can do this. And the concept is the same with the Lord to get in his presence and be still. Amen. I could give you more, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. So get in the presence and be still. Now, point number two is my, sec my favorite point. It says, then Peter answered and said to Jesus, sorry, verse 6, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and they were greatly afraid. They heard the voice. This is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased to hear him. Verse 7, but Jesus came and touched them. But Jesus came and touched them. Woo! But Jesus came and touched them. Here's point number two. When you get in the presence... Let Jesus touch you. Let Jesus touch you. Let Jesus impact you. Let him touch your life. You know, there was a moment tonight in worship 
where the presence of God was so thick in the room. But the question is, did you respond? The question is, did you let him touch you? The question is, did you let did you let his presence affect your heart? Did you let his presence affect your mind? It's always blown my mind how two people can come into a service like this. Two people can hear the same worship songs. Two people can hear the same sermon. Two people can respond to the same altar call. Two people can walk out those doors and only one of them are actually transformed. Because did you let him touch you? Did you let him touch you? Did you let the presence of God affect your mind? Did you let the presence of God affect your heart? Or are you still marinating on the fact that you don't have money to pay that bill? News flash for you. Like I said, he's the provider. Let him touch you. Are you still marinating on that, 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 that sickness, that disease, that diagnosis? News flash. He's the healer. Let him touch you. Let him touch you. Let the, the friendship of God influence and change you. Be impacted by his friendship. I have a friend right now that she says, that's crazy to everything. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. She's always saying it. That's crazy. Well, the other day I noticed I said something to my wife, and my wife goes, that's crazy. And I looked at her, and I said, you sound just like our friend. Because she's let friendship impact her. She's let friendship influence her. You're starting to see the fruit of their friendship. You know that everything Jesus touch, touches is redeemed and restored. Everything he touches is redeemed and restored. Let me tell you a story. In 2017, a guy by the name of Corey Russell got hired on staff at the upper room. Some of you may know who he is. If you don't, he's a father in the faith. He's a fiery man. He, he's an amazing preacher. And he, everywhere he goes, he leads people into encounter. He just is a friend of God. And there was a season where... Uh, as he came on staff and started preaching, it seemed like the presence of God was so thick at the upper room that people were falling on their faces and they were beginning to groan in the spirit. They were beginning to travail. They were beginning to have weird manifestations because it was evident that God was touching them. And I remember sitting in the room watching some of the people that were encountering God that I didn't think should be encountering God because I knew some of the things that were going on in their life. I knew some of the ways they were talking about other people. And at first, I sat in my chair, told you I was going to get down here with you, and I kind of was like, mm, that person, mm, that person, mm. and then all of a sudden, the conviction of God hit me, and I heard the voice of the Lord say, you can be touched too. You can be touched too. And you know what I did? I wasn't feeling this overwhelming overflow with the Spirit of God and joy hitting me and angelic angels saying, pick up your flag and dance. I was feeling offense in my heart. But by faith, I got out of my chair and I got on my knees and then I got on my face. Again, by faith, because I wasn't feeling this overwhelming thing. And I said, God, you have permi permission to touch my life. And as I began to pray that prayer to the Lord, all of a sudden it started like a slow trickle, like when you turn on your faucet and it just starts to drip. But then all of a sudden, you know, you turn it all the way and it's just a, a fresh pour. My eyes were like that. All of a sudden, tears were flowing down my face so strongly that I couldn't contain it. All of a sudden, that flow of tears started to turn into a groan. All of a sudden, that groan started turning into my life was physically being touched with the presence of God. Because I let him touch me. Let him touch you. Let go of your dignity. Let go of your pride. Let go of your way. Say, Jesus, touch me. You know, Jesus touched the blind man and he got his sight back. Jesus touched, touched the 12-year-old girl that was dead and she was raised to new life. Jesus touched the cripple man and he was able to run home. There was a Roman soldier who, who had his ear cut off. Jesus touched it. And he was restored. Jesus touched Nicodemus' heart, who was a Pharisee. And he encountered the presence of the Messiah. And there's a story in Genesis 32, and it's where Jacob wrestles with God. And Jacob grabs hold of God, and it's the most interesting story because he tells the Lord, as he has a hold of the Lord, he says, I will not let go until you touch me. I will not let go until you bless me. I will not let go until my life has been marked by your life. And guess what? The presence of God touches him. And the Bible says he never walked the same. And I want to ask you tonight, have you gotten so hungry for God that you've said, Lord, I don't ever want to walk the same because I've been touched by you. 
Because there's an invitation for that for you tonight. I wrote this down as I was preparing for you. I'm not okay with the normal. I'm not okay with mediocre. I'm not okay with basic. I want my life to be touched by God. So get in the presence. And when you do, be still. And as you're being still, let Jesus touch you. And let me give you the last point of growing in friendship with God. It says, but Jesus came and touched them and said, arise, do not be afraid. And when they had lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. Come on, the fruit of when you've been touched by Jesus is you see no one but him. You can always tell when someone's been touched by Jesus because they're wild. They're a little uncomfortable. But all they see is him. They've been touched by him. And in verse 10, uh, verse 9, sorry, it says, Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one, till the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Here's point number three. And this one's really important, actually. Not every encounter is meant to be shared. I know these are really simple points, but I promise they'll take you a long ways. Not every encounter is meant to be shared. You know, the truest of friends know things about one another that no one else does. If all your intimacy is public, it's not intimacy, it's prostitution. If all of your intimacy is public, it's not intimacy, it's prostitution. See, I have a lot of people who tell me, I want to live a life of worship. Oh, and they're always at the upper room. They just are prayer room junkies. They're at every worship set. They're always in the, in the prayer room. And, and I've started saying this to people when they tell me I want to live a life of worship. I've said, okay, I want you to do a survey of your life. Do a survey of your life really quickly of all of the times you have worship. And if all of those times of worship are in public and not in secret, you don't live a life of worship. Because a life of worship can be measured in secret. If, all, if the only time you worship is in public, I would say you're just following the trend. You're just following the, the, the Christian hype of let's sing a good song. The true measure of worship is found in secret. The truest of friends know things about one another that no one else does. And there's a difference between keeping secrets and preserving intimacy. Have you ever had a friend that's like, hey, just... Just keep this between me and you. Let's just keep this secret. Normally, that's rooted in, in gossip. Normally, that's rooted in a toxic culture. Normally, if that thing that they shared with you gets into the light, there will be dire consequences. But preserving intimacy is different. See, you would know that my wife and I are close if we were in the room. But majority of our conversations, you'll never hear. Majority of our times together, you'll never see. The deepest things we've talked about aren't on Instagram. They're not in a book. They're not this big public thing to see. They're in secret. It's preserving intimacy. Not every encounter is meant to be shared. Did you know that you were made for the shadow of his wing? You were made to live in the shadow of his wing. That means you were made to be hidden in God. How many of you know the name Heidi Baker? Oh, Mama Heidi is a, she's a mama in the faith. Um, if you don't know who that is, go look it up. Just don't ever listen to another sermon I preach. Just go find her sermons and listen to her. She's amazing. She's a mama in the faith. And um, yeah, you can go look up who she is. But uh, I was at a conference and she was there and my wife said, let's ask Mama Heidi to pray for us. And we walked up to her and we said, uh, Miss Heidi, would you mind praying for my wife and I? And for five minutes... She prayed for us. And the only thing she prayed for five minutes was this. Hide them, God. Hide them. Hide them in the shadow of your wing. Hide them, God. Hide them. Hide them. And what I have learned is that the true test of intimacy is not how many moments do you have in public with God. It's how many do you have in secret. How many do you have in secret with God? Billy Graham, I'm sure you know that name. When he was about to pass from this earth to the next, from this life to the next, sorry. 
um, he was about to pass away. Uh, there was a, there's a, you can find it in, a, in an article. You can probably Google it and find it. But uh, he was interviewed. And he was interviewed by a Christian magazine. And the Christian magazine asked him, they said, uh, they said, Mr. Billy Graham, um, if you could go back and do anything different, what would you do? Or would you? And this was his answer, and I thought it was so interesting. He said, if I could go back and do anything different, I would say yes less to public ministry, and I would say yes more to being alone with God. I would say yes less to the public ministry, and I would say yes more to being alone with God. You know, Moses longed for the mountaintop with Jesus, where he was away from the people. The people thought Moses was dead because he had spent so much time with God. David longed for the field. He longed for the field to be in that place with Jesus. Jesus longed for withdrawing away from the crowds to be with the Father. See, not every encounter is meant to be shared. If there's someone who can hop on the keys and help me out, that would be awesome. And I want to tell you tonight, growing in friendship with God is not about your name being known. It's not about having these awesome songs you've written or these awesome sermons that you can preach. My favorite times with God are not these moments when I'm standing on the stage preaching to you, though I love it and I'm called to it. My favorite moments with God are when I'm sitting in this this chair. I have this one chair in my backyard. Can't sit out there in the summer, it's too hot. But in the fall and in the winter and in the spring, that chair, when I could sit in that chair and be alone with God, read the word and weep, oh, Those are the moments where I go, God, God, we're friends. We're friends. And tonight, I want to call you into friendship with God. I want to tell you one last story before we do an altar call. This was, a, this was back in April. I was in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was at a young adult conference similar to this. And I had preached a message on the fear of the Lord. And after I preached on the fear of the Lord, this young 20-something came up to me, and he said, Aaron, I loved your sermon but I haven't given my life to Jesus. And I said, well, why haven't you given your life to Jesus? And he said, well, I actually want to, but, but I'm afraid. And I said, well, what are you afraid of? And he said, well, I'm 21. And when I was 12, I started taking guitar lessons because I knew I wanted to be a musician. And this year, I got my first record deal here in Nashville, Tennessee. I said, that's awesome, bro. So what are you afraid of? He said, well, my music is not Christian music. And It's actually not the greatest music. Some of the lyrics are bad. And I'm afraid if I give my life to Jesus, he's going to take my record deal. And I'm listening to him talk. And I said, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe he will take your record deal. I don't know. But here's what I do know. And I looked at this kid. I said, your your record deal is worldly. It's earthly. When you cross from this life to the next one, you can't take your record deal with you. It's earthly. It's earthly. And you weren't made for earthly things. And then I leaned in and I looked at him and I put my finger on his heart and I said, but relationship with Jesus is eternal. And you were made for eternal things. You were made for God's glory. All of a sudden, this this 21-year-old dude who had tattoos all over his body, his muscles were probably bigger than my head. Like, he was a big dude, and I'm like, this guy's kind of scary. You know, I'm leaning in, like, pointing at him, and I'm like, please don't beat me up. All of a sudden, this dude that looks so hard just, (laughs) he starts weeping. And he said, no one ever told me I was made for God's glory. And I looked at him, and I said, bro, you were made for the glory. You were made for Jesus. You were made to be a friend with God. Listen, I want to say the same thing to you because maybe you've never heard that. You were made for God's glory. You were made for intimacy with God. Yes, you. Yes, you from Donna, Texas. You were made for intimacy with God. You were made to be a friend of God. The same God who gave the lion its roar. The same God who told the ocean at South Padre Island, you have to stop here. The same God who hung the Orion belt and the stars and the constellations like it was a curtain. That same God's desire is not for the stars to shine. It's for you to shine in his presence. You were made for God's glory. so tonight I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus if you're in this room and you know I'm not walking with God you know oftentimes we go 
If you've never given your life to Jesus, a lot of you in here have probably responded to an altar call before, but you know tonight in this room, you're not walking with Jesus. If that's you and you're going, man, I don't know him. I don't know him because there's a day on the calendar that you don't know, but heaven does. There's a day on the calendar where you, where you will stand before him and he will either say to you, well done, good and faithful servant, or he's going to look you square in the eyes and he's going to say the worst phrase you'll ever hear in your life. I never knew you. I never knew you. I never knew you, he'll say. And tonight, if you know you're in the room and you don't know him, you're not being known by him. You're not walking with Jesus. He's not Lord of your life. You have not given your life to Jesus. You're not walking with him. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. Now, in this moment is normally the moment where there's faith in the room for you to stand. And also, there's this weird way the devil finds his way to trickle in here. And the same way there's faith, there's also fear. And you're probably sitting in the room and your heart's beating a little bit. And you're going, that's for me, but I don't want to stand up. I want to tell you. We don't ask you, guys like me, don't ask you to stand up and respond to altar calls so you make us feel good. Listen, I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to sleep really good. Regardless if there's one person that responds or all of you respond. The reason we ask you to stand is because you are meant to respond to the Lord. It takes faith to stand. It takes faith. In the moment you allow faith to produce itself in you, let me pastor you for a minute. Faith, uh, fear has no room in your life. Fear has no room. You want to see fear broken? Respond in faith. Say, that's me. I'm not letting fear keep me in my seat. Listen, tonight, if you want to know God, and be known by God. If you want to give your life to Jesus, on the count of three, I want to ask you to stand across the room. I'm going to count to three, and when I hit three, I just want you to stand up. Who knows? Maybe there's someone sitting next to you that they want to stand too, and they're waiting for you to stand so they can have the boldness to do it. But tonight, you want to give your life to Jesus. You know you have not given it to him. On the count of three, ready? One, two, three. Stand up. Come on. Come on. Come on. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, this is what I want you to do. If that's you and you've, you've stood, I want you just to put your hands out in front of you or you can lift them high, whatever you want. And I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And then I don't know, Pastor Josh, if we have a ministry team. Do we have a ministry team? Okay, awesome. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and then in a moment, I'm going to ask you to come to the front. Why am I going to ask you to come to the front? Because we have a ministry team that wants to pray with you. Come on, you're meant to follow Jesus in community. So if that was you, you just responded, and if you wanted to stand and you didn't, you can stand at any moment as we pray this prayer. But I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. But I want you to connect your own heart. I want you to connect your own faith. But I'm going to give you the prayer. I want you to say out loud. I want you to say, Jesus. Say it loud. Come on with confidence. Say, Jesus, here's my life. Say, Jesus, you can have all of me. I want you to put your hand on your head like this. And I want you to say, Jesus, would you renew my mind? And to put your hand on your heart and say, Jesus, would you dwell here in my heart? Say, Jesus, my heart is yours. In your name I pray. Amen. Now, if that's you and you responded to that, I want you to come to the front. Just come get on your knees. Some of you are already up here, but I want you to come get on your knees on the front. And in a moment, we're going to lead you into worship. And you're going to have a moment where the power of God touches your life. Yeah, you guys can come up here. And you can just get on your knees all around. You don't have to do it for me. You can circle around the whatever. But I just want you to respond. I'm going to lead you to respond to him tonight. Now, before we do that, here's the next group of people I want to pray for. If you're still in your seats and you know I've given my life to the Lord, but I want to grow in friendship with God. It's you. You're like, I want to grow in friendship with God. Man, what you were talking about tonight, Aaron, I feel God's invitation to me. Then this is what I want you to do. Right where you're sitting down, I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I want you to put your hands out in front of you and close your eyes. And I'm going to pray for you. And then if Nick or somebody can lead us in a song. And then if we have a ministry team that can lay hands on some of these guys, some of you that responded tonight, I'm going to come around and I'm going to lay hands on you. I'm going to pray for you. But if that's you and you want to grow in friendship with God, Lord, I, I thank you that you see everyone that's in this room. Lord, you see them and you know them. Lord, you formed them. You fashioned them. You created their hair color. You created their eye color. You created, Lord, every mole on their body. You know them. 
And I pray that tonight, Jesus, would be a night that you would begin to invite them into deeper friendship. Thank you, Jesus, for friendship with God. Lord, I pray that tonight is not a night where my sermon transforms anybody. Lord, I pray tonight is a night where your presence rests on people in the room. I pray tonight is a night where they encounter you, God, the living God, Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, the the high priest and bridegroom, our soon coming king. Lord, would you touch every life in this room tonight in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship, and I want you to begin to worship God. I want you to begin to dialogue with God. I want you to begin to give God honor and praise and begin to worship him and say, Lord, here's my heart. Lord, here's my life. And as you do, someone may come around and lay hands on you and start praying for you. But tonight and right now is a moment for you to engage God. Amen. So, Lord, we honor you tonight. Lord, I thank you for your presence. Let it fall. Let it rest. Let every life be touched tonight, Lord. Let us be transformed by your glory. Let us be transformed. Teach us how to linger. Teach us how to be still in your presence. Lord, we give you permission to touch us. Touch our lives, God. Touch our minds, God. Touch our bodies, God. Touch our hearts, God. You can touch us. Lord, and build intimacy with us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Come on, let's worship. Give me Jesus. you tonight. i 
Excel. He's pastored with me for the last 10 years or so. And um, I'm going to let him pray into some things tonight. So just felt a word from the Lord. Aaron leaned over to me before coming up. He says, what do you feel? What does the Lord want to do? And I just feel like the Lord wants to open ears. He wants you to know his voice. He wants to open your ears, your spiritual ears. He wants you to know your voice. And if you're praying, you can tune me out. But he wants you to know his voice. And then I heard the Lord, he said, there's no pressure. There's no pressure. And I was thinking about when you go on the airplane and you land, there's pressure in your ears. And you can't hear very well. And the Lord's saying, there's no pressure. You can hear. There's no pressure, and for some of you, the Lord is saying that I want to release the pressure from your life. I want to release the pressure of your life. You don't have to perform to be a son or a daughter. You don't have to be perfect to be a son or a daughter. There is only one that is perfect. There is only one that is good. There is only one who has done all things perfectly, and he lives inside of you. And when you release yourself, when you accept that in your life, the pressure is gone and your ears begin to open. So I want to pray if that's you and you want to hear the voice of the Lord because I feel like specifically the Lord says, I want to speak to them. And the pressure is off and you're a son or a daughter. And if that's you, you can just receive like this and I want to pray into it. So Lord, open our ears, Jesus. Open our ears, Jesus. Help us understand that we're sons and we're daughters. Oh, the pressure is off. The pressure is off, Lord. We want to hear your voice. Come, good shepherd. Come, good shepherd. We want to know the voice of the shepherd. who have ears to hear, ears to hear. Lord, I pray that you would give us hunger, hunger for your word. Would you give this young generation hunger for your word, hunger for the secret place, hunger to hear the whispers of God. Oh, the things that no one can take away from us, the things that no one can criticize, the things that no one can say differently because we know the voice of the Father. Lord, open ears, open ears, open ears, open ears, open ears. Lead us into obedience because we know your voice. Lead us into following because we know your voice. Lead us into discipleship and following the good shepherd that when he comes and he says, drop your nets, that we would go. Lord, open ears, Jesus, for lovers that are abandoned for the gospel, that would leave the world in an instant if the rabbi comes. from him he knows you it's about communion union with him knowing him him knowing you he loves you that never changes he loves you
in his presence just for a moment longer and just gaze at his beauty oh the beauty of our savior just rest in his presence rest in his love Thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, because you have heard the cries of our hearts. Oh, and you have answered, and your glory has come down, 
in the person of your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you. Oh, just give them thanks right there, right where from, right where you are. Just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for touching me tonight. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Oh, there's no better place than to be at your feet. Oh, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, Lord God, in the lives of this generation, Father. We thank you, Lord, because you have opened eyes. We thank you because you have opened ears. We thank you, Lord, because you have opened hearts, Father God. Oh, Father, we just want to rest in your presence. Just rest there a little bit longer. Whatever's going to happen after can wait. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Jesus, because you call us friends. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for answering the cries of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for every single youth that is here tonight, Father God. We thank you for each and every one that is here tonight, Father God. Oh, Father God, let not tonight be like any other night. Father God, let tonight be a night where everything changes, Father God. Oh, Father God, let us not walk out of here the same way we came in. Oh, thank you, Jesus. The time has come and it's the hardest thing that I have to do and it's end this service tonight oh but we have a wonderful promise that we can take his presence everywhere we go so let us let us all unite and let's all close this service together everyone look to your neighbor say there's another day there's more. Whoo. Give them glory. Give them glory. All the glory is yours, Lord. All the glory is yours. Everyone, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you. We thank you because you always show up. 
Oh, we thank you, Lord, because you have released your word. You have released the word that gives life. You have released more of your spirit, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Oh, Father God, we put all the people that are here tonight, Father God, we declare and decree a blessing over their lives, Father God. Let them take this blessing, Father God, as they walk out these doors and get in their cars, Father. We ask that you surround them with your mighty angels, Father God. Protect them and keep them, Father God. Let them tonight, Father God, commune upon their beds. As they lay down, Father God, let them meditate on what you did tonight. And continue to light that fire. Continue to light that passion, that hunger for Jesus. Oh, Father, we thank you. And we give you glory. And all the children of God say. Yeah. Woo. And we're dismissed tonight. But never from his presence. I just have one announcement to make guys. Before we leave. Can we put the flyer on the screen guys. So we're going to be. There's going to be fruits.